Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back to our conference, America's Climate Change Future. Um, so we had a morning of economics, and we learned a lot about economy, I mean, about the <laughs> problem of climate change and, um, and how markets are failing to incorporate risks as they, you know, are, I would say, objectively ver verifiable risks looking forward especially. Um, to coastal properties, to financial markets, um, and there it's, it's vastly underestimated the um, probable recession or or worse that we face um, as a result when when those are finally incorporated. So I mean, really, to me, as I said this morning, the, the question is to me: Why don't we have a, a science-based and adequate climate policy in the United States? And that's where I think. Um, uh, sociology can be especially useful. So we have on this panel four sociologists who are going to uh, really give it to us, uh, really, uh, I think, open up the, they are the pioneers, these, uh, putting forward a whole new area of research um, that uh, we, I think, is very strategic on this issue. So institutional dynamics of climate inaction and inaction, we're going to hear from uh, Bob Brule from now here at Brown, Lordana Loy um, from Cornell, Justin Farrell from Yale, and Carrie Ard from Ohio State. Juan Ha, unfortunately, was a, a, uh, from the Energy Foundation, our discussant, was a casualty of the polar vortex because he's in San Francisco, so his planes, I guess, uh, there was no physical way possible to get from San Francisco to um, the East Coast yesterday afternoon. So that's unfortunate. So we'll, I'll, I'll get us started, but then um, we'll uh, rely on you all in the audience. Um, and what else can I say? Um, there's a lot to say about denial. I mean, what I say is that de denial is a renewable resource. <laughs> we as individuals live on many sorts of denial. And then also there's um, this kind of denial industry that, uh, you know, it's really in the interests of uh, very large um, economic sectors to uh, keep us in the dark. And so we're going to learn a lot about how they are doing so. It's a very complex network and it's a very powerful one. Bob? Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully my presentation will work today. What's interesting for me is that I hear a lot of talk about what we call the denial machine. And for me, that's, if you look at their strategies, like I've been looking at them for the past several years, that's 20% maybe of their process. If you look at where their actual money goes, a lot of it goes into what I consider to be positive corporate propaganda <coughs> to foster the continued use of fossil fuels in the economy. And so although a lot of analysis has looked at attacks on scientific information, and it's not surprising that climate scientists, being the subject of those attacks, would want to focus on that. That's when you take dollar for dollar and you look at it, most of the money, and I would say probably 80 percent of the money that the fossil fuel corporations utilize to influence public opinion and, and political action goes much more into their, into what I consider to be their positive corporate propaganda. So the oil industry has a rather long and jaded history of a bad corporate, as a bad corporate actor. Starting in 1904 with Ida Tarbell's book, Standard Oil of New Jersey, the fossil fuel industry has been seen as a rapacious, polluting, and greedy industry over the, over the entire century. And they've been laboring to get out of that, out of that image since then. And over on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of the, the, the person on the right is Ivy Lee. He's considered to be the father of modern public relations. He went to work for the Rockefellers and was instrumental in the first sort of public relations of getting John D. Rockefeller to look like a good guy because he gave out dimes. That was one of his ideas. There he is. He's, he's pictured there. Um, 
with the president of Standard Oil of New Jersey, which is now known as ExxonMobil, when they were planning and developing the, the, the development of the American Petroleum Institute in 1919. So we're coming on the 100th anniversary of the creation of one of the first major trade associations informed by modern public relations. And it was I, Ivy Lee's ideas that were incorporated into the, into the American Petroleum Institute. And, as, and a lot of American Petroleum Institute is really one of the first modern PR agencies. And it was, it was in, so the public relations industry has been grown up in concert with the fossil fuel industry. Now, through the, through the 30s and the 40s, there, there was a lot of sort of positive PR uh, associated with, with the fossil fuel industry, mostly run by um, the American Petroleum Institute. But then starting in the 70s and 80s, that's when mobile got going under the guise of a guy named Herb Schmertz. And what he developed, he developed three major tactics that the fossil fuel industry developed. The first thing was that the mobile, mobile oil company was really, really instrumental in pushing all the way through to the, to the Supreme Court the rights of corporate speech is that in 1978, in the First National Bank of Boston versus Pilate, they, that was when the Supreme Court said corporations have the right to free speech just like everybody else. Before that, they had to have they, you were allowed to constrict corporate speech. This gave them corporate speech rights, which was a very, very big win for corporations. The second initiative of mobile oil was, and I'm probably sure there's people in this room that have seen them, were the, were the advertorials in the, in, the, in the New York Times that they ran from 1970 to 88. And the third thing was, and this is really an interesting thing, is, is their mobile started out sponsoring uh, Masterpiece Theater. And the idea behind this kind of sponsorship, and now you see it everywhere, you know, corporations put their names on museums all over the place, uh, or, you know, high quality TV, is it's called the affinity of purpose advertising, is that you associate a corporation with a high prestige cultural institution, which means the cultural institution aids in the reputation of mobile oil. So mobile oil gains its, in its reputation. So, so this has been a, 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 a long-standing process. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Kurt Davies and the Center for uh, the Climate uh, Investigation Center, who's right over there, got hold of one of their internal assessments of what mobile oil thought about what they'd accomplished with their public relations program. And what's really interesting is they make two, two kind of bald-faced claims in this thing. This one is that they say that they shifted the editorial stance of the New York Times. And they claim so, and they provide several you know, pages of documentation of how they shifted the editorial process. The other and a more insidious one, which is I find, is that they argue that they were responsible, or at least contributed to the America's shift to the right by seeding their ideas, and these are their words, collective unconscious of the American public. And so this is really a highly sophisticated campaign drawing on the work of Freud, which gets played into the public relations literature and things like that. So, so this kind of process, it's not denying science. It's fostering public opinions that are favorable to the continuation, continued use of fossil fuels. So this matured after the 70s and 80s into the sort of the, the idea of what, what we call the corporate promotion industry. This is a big deal in public relations. And, and the idea of these, um, and, and virtually all corporations do this. There's, there's, you know, it's not like saying that, you know, you can even see wind energy. Citibank has a nice commercial out about how wonderful they are because they put up some windmills. Um, but what it really involves is the skillful use of corporate propaganda. This is propaganda. Make no mistake about it. Um, that it works, it works to try to, the first thing it does is it tries to connect the corporation and its image 
with the idea of, you know, first of all, we're good corporate citizens, and that it, it involves in, uh, identifying the corporation with the ideas of the good life, progress, prosperity, and rationality, all wrapped up in this one corporate image. And what this does is, first of all, it fosters and improves their corporate reputation, which actually pays real dividends on the stock market. But the other thing is that it, it works to offset possible action that's adverse. If that, what we find is that corporations with a bad reputation have a much higher probability of getting regulated. So if you're all good actors and you're all responsible citizens, there's no need to regulate you. So, so I, what I'm doing is I'm going to let the data speak for themselves is that if I can get it to work, here's ExxonMobil's latest one. And I think I just pushed this to make it go. Where there's life, where there's progress, there's energy. As the world grows, the need for energy grows too. And ExxonMobil is playing a big role in providing it, making advantaged investments in different corners of the world, growing production, providing jobs, building new facilities, and upgrading others to make high-value products, creating shareholder value and driving economic development all around the world. And we're working on ways to provide energy while addressing the risks of climate change, producing clean burning natural gas to reduce emissions from power plants, capturing CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere, and exploring unexpected energy sources like biofuels made from algae. We're also investing in ways you might not expect, helping communities prevent malaria, empowering women to grow their incomes, and supporting education. Energy. It powers our lives today, and it's the key to tomorrow. And no one is more committed to providing it than the people of ExxonMobil. Energy lives here. Run that four or five thousand times. <laughs> okay. This is what this is the kind of thing that we're we're dealing with. So so the question we asked in, our, in, in the paper we did is how much do they really spend on this stuff? So we looked at it. We went to what I went to is there. You can't get all of the data. What what you can get is you can get how much advertising buys they spent their money on. So we went to the, this Kentar Media database, which allows you to download how much actual advertising buys they bought. Doesn't include production. Doesn't include anything else. And this is what we got. Virtual first of all, virtually every major oil company, and here's the five that we we looked at, has a major corporate promotion program. And the, when we looked at the spending, in total for these, we got we did finally get 30 years, um, so we could run some regressions. Um, 3.6 billion dollars total across these years. Average annual expenditures of 120 million, with a peak of 315 million dollars in 2010. Hmm, what was happening in 2010? We we're having legislation. Okay, so. We set up a nice little regression. Here's our path model uh, for those of you who care about this. But uh, what we did is we looked at three independent variables, which was level of congressional activity on climate change, major oil spills, which usually makes sense because they have a big oil spill, they've got to fix their corporate reputation, or did major scientific reports like the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment have any difference? We thought about looking through uh, intermediate areas of uh, media coverage through climate change, and then finally, public concern over climate change. Those of you saying the IRO should go the other way around, we did Granger causality to look at the an analysis of, of statistical effects. So we did that. Here's the results. Public opinion drops out, scientific reports drop out. They don't really have any, anything to do with what corporations spend on, public on, on their corporate expenditures. The big driver, both directly and indirectly, is what 
the Senate and the House do. It's that if it looks like there's going to be legislation, there's going to be hearings on it, they start pouring it on. Okay, so Green New Deal, that gets more, ex we're going to see increases in this. BP just came out with its latest campaign, I think, two days ago. So we, so we would predict that. Um, okay. Oh, I got two minutes. Well, I got to, well, then I'll go to my conclusion. That's easy. <laughs> So, 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 you know, I got uh, four takeaway points here. First of all, is that corporate actions to oppose climate action aren't just climate denial and misinformation, but that the clever use of corporate propaganda is, and corporate promotion is one of their other strategies and probably their biggest. This is where the big money goes. When you say $100 million in a year or $200 million in a year, that's a lot of money. Um, the, the, other, the other problem for this is that the environmental groups have no equivalent. I've never seen, you know, a Greenpeace or Sierra Club ad run, but you'll probably see these kind of ads on the Super Bowl. Okay, I'm sure Exxon will probably buy some space and API will buy some space. And finally, we don't really know what this does. What does looking at 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 of these ads do cumulatively do to public opinion and concern about climate change? You look at what ExxonMobil just did, you know, there's no problem. Everything's on the way. We're solving malaria. We're dealing with climate change. I mean, Senator, you don't have to do anything, right? I feel so much better. Yeah, you feel so much more confident. So, so I, I, I'm going to leave you. And I wanted to do this, and I'm going to run one minute over because I know it takes two minutes to run this film. But, but for me, what, what's really amazing is that I did find a study that talked about P, or, the PR professionals doing papers for other PR people say, you think that there's problems with cynicism about your corporate promotion ads? Well, you're probably right. Here's how you get around that. Okay, and this is the kind of study that PR professionals do, is that you use stirring music and videos, uh, uh, stirring music and images, and, and, and so what, what, what I'm going to show you here is probably the penultimate <laughs> manipulation of public opinion. You know, it must have cost, they probably did what, a, minute, uh, a million dollars for every 10 seconds on this thing because it's so, this is the American Petroleum Institute's video that I've showed to a couple of classes and it's just left the students agog that this could be done this well. So I'm gonna leave you with this if it runs. the things that we're doing with technology. We're pushing the boundary of what the oil and gas industry has seen. We drilled a lot of wells through several years of development here on the Durham Ranch. At this point now, when we have depleted the wells, we've actually plugged and abandoned those wells and we're looking at the reclaimed landscape behind us. Pipelines truly are the safest mode of transportation for oil and natural gas. You get a lot of product from point A to point B and we're able to do it very safely. He's been able to get this plastic so thin and so light. When I put it on, it, ju it just feels normal. And I can swing it perfectly fine from hip to knee, and it just works great. We want to show our communities that we care. We want to show our communities that we're doing our part to mitigate or minimize emissions to the environment.
Thank you. <laughs> you feel Thank better, you, Senator? Yeah. Where is this going to be? You don't want the PowerPoint. No, no, I want the PowerPoint. Yeah. No, you do. You do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not the. Um, not the. Not the PDF. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The PDF. Oh my God. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Loredana Loy. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'll be talking about um, the Tea Party movement and climate change policy. So some of you are probably wondering what um, does the Tea Party movement have to do with climate change policy, right? So uh, just a few things on that. Um, first, scholars are only now discovering that um, the Tea Party had long-lasting effects, and, and they're trying to, to, to see how the Tea Party movement has been underestimated. And, and um, especially in areas where the Tea Party was not a key player, right? So I, I would suggest with this uh, study that uh, the climate change policy was w one of those areas. And second, although the, um, the Tea Party movement's ma main goals were cutting taxes and reducing government spending, the Tea Party was also very vocal about opposing any kind of legislation that um, was designed to curtail um, carbon emissions. And, and in fact, they were um, organizing protests against legislators who were uh, supporting the cap and trade bill back in 2009. Uh, and, and third, um, the Tea Party movement not only benefited from a, a very vigorous grassroots um, support, it also um, um, and benefited from elite support. So um, by that, I mean the Tea Party caucus in Congress, but also um, interest groups such as Americans for Prosperity. Um, who is a group that is um, heavily invested in the climate change counter movement and um, through projects such as the hot air tour at the time. But what's uh, important for this study with, with the project, the no climate tax pledge, federal, uh, federal pledge that uh, ended up being signed by uh, a, a large number of, of Congress members, including Democrats, some Democrats. Um, so the question then is, is how, how did the Tea Party really um, influence, or was there any influence on the climate change policy domain at the time? So to investigate this, um, I look at the 112 um, um, congressional session, particularly the House of Representatives at the time, and um, which had included uh, 60 Tea Party caucus members, 123 signatories of the No Climate Tax Pledge, but most importantly, um, about um, bills and amendments that were climate change related, there were more uh, bills and amendments designed to hinder climate action than to uh, promote climate action in this particular session, right, after the, the Tea Party caucus moves in. And um, just to mention a bit uh, the context prior to this session, we, we know that the, the Congress was highly polarized between Democrats and Republicans, and um, also that um, the climate change policy arena was highly um, uh, contested. But re regardless of that, there were still some, some sort of uh, bipartisan efforts between Democrats and Republicans at the times. So, and that we don't see that coming after. Um, okay, so the empirical strategy for this um, study I look at two dimensions of the climate change policy process. One is the sponsorship and co-sponsorship of, um, of bills and amendments related to climate change. And the second one is um, the voting that takes place on these um, bills and amendments. And, and here I have the um, vote for climate action as a reference. Remember, I mentioned that there are two types of efforts in this session, against climate action and for climate action. Okay, and for, uh, in the interest of time today, I'm only going to speak about the findings for the, the voting uh, models. Um, okay, and um, here I have um, the factors that are possibly affecting um, how the legislators vote. So the key variables for that are the Tea Party caucus membership, signing the pledge, and then Tea Party grassroots activism in district. And then some of the controls would be um, public opinion, which um, is basically a measure of, of um, um, how the public supported regulating carb, uh, CO2 as a pollutant in, in the districts, and um, 
The second one would be contribution from political actions committees, uh, from vulnerable and benefiting industries. And here, I, uh, when I say vulnerable industries, I mean things like uh, oil and gas, um, mining, uh, utilities, and so on. And benefiting would be alternative energy, right, or nuclear. And um, another one would be the presence on a, of environmental group uh, membership in the district, um, as well as um, the presence of vulnerable and benefiting industries in the district, which is different from the PACs, because this, um, this is basically just a measure of the economic landscape of the district versus organized interests, which would be the political action committees. Okay. And um, for the data, um, I have constructed a data set in that includes um, about 123 bills and amendments, and out of those, 123, 70 received a vote, and those those kind of correspond to about 30,000 roll call votes, which stand at the basis of my analysis. And of course, uh, I have um, a bunch of other measures um, and factors, an array of um, factors such as district, legislator, interest group characteristics to go in the models. Um, and oh, this is just um, just um, trying to uh, emphasize again the difference between for, against climate action and for climate action type of bills, we see that we had 38 against climate action bills and 32 for climate action bills and amendments in this session. So more efforts to try to, to stop any kind of um, climate action. Um, okay, and the findings. So it, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, this graph here, right? Uh, basically, it just says that um, the probability of, of voting for climate action if you're a Democrat is much higher, right? But it, what is um, interesting is this next one, which looks at Republicans only. And we see that um, if you were a Tea Party caucus member, you are less likely to vote for climate action even compared to other Republicans. So we see that they're, they're kind of uh, more gung ho about opposing any kind of climate policy than their other Republican co um, colleagues. And uh, similar with the um, no, no climate tax pledge signatories, uh, again, this is Republicans only. We see that those who sign the pledge, and again, this isn't a surprise, those who have signed the pledge uh, would be more, uh, uh, less likely to vote for climate action than those who have not signed the pledge. And just to give you kind of a um, better perspective, I'm going to show you the, um, give you a, um, the full uh, view of the models here. So uh, just for those who, um, just to explain how to read this, we have the neutral line at one. So any, any estimates that fall on that line basically are not significant, and anything that falls on the sides outside of the line is significant. And of course, on, on the left, we have negative impacts on the vote, and on the right, we have positive impacts. So again, just to recap here, we see the, two, the, the three um, main um, uh, variables of interest. Um, here, what we can say is that uh, um, being a Tea Party caucus member basically translates into about 28 um, percent estimated uh, reduction in the estimated odds of, of uh, voting for climate action uh, compared to other Republicans, because we're looking at Republicans only here. And uh, again, uh, the no climate tax pledge um, translates to uh, a reduction of about um, 15, uh, 14 percent uh, compared to those who didn't sign the pledge. But what is interesting to see here is that Tea Party activism did not uh, play a role. You see it's, it's right on that line. So grassroots activism did not count. But, um, and some other surprising things here is that public opinion did not matter to Republicans at all, right? And also the other thing that didn't matter, which is a big surprise, is the political action committees they, uh, so, uh, didn't make a difference for them. Um, and then to kind of give you uh, uh, the complete view, let's look at the Democrats. And here we'll see that um, some of the things that matter to them are pu public opinion, so quite um, um, the opposite. Uh, so public opinion matters to the Democrats. Um, Tea Party activism, again, doesn't matter. But what matters to Democrats, political action committees from vulnerable industries matter. So interesting to see that um, at least for this uh, session of the House, we have this kind of dynamic. You see that the biggest one here is Tea Party support in the district, which this, this could be picking up on basically the conservative, conservatism of the district itself. Um, okay. So um, with that, just to conclusions, um, 
so we've seen that the Tea Party grassroots um, elements do not appear to influence uh, either stages of the process, either voting or sponsorship, which I didn't show you, that, but I'm, I'm just uh, informing you now. And um, however, the elite elements seem, seem to, to work for both stages, uh, sponsorship and um, voting. So this finding, what they suggest um, to me, uh, um, are, are three things here. Um, elite conservatives used the Tea Party brand for, for some of the following. So first, they would signal to, to their um, counterparts, to their other conservatives, their position on climate policy. Second, they would strengthen their opposition to policy designed to promote climate action. And third, they would be able to pursue a set of conservative agendas that the Tea Party only loosely pursued. So it wasn't like on their, on their, on their main frame, but you know, they were uh, aligned with it. And I, I just wanted to leave you with a question that um, somebody actually earlier on mentioned. Um, what, what would it mean to the to, um, progressive caucus on the left today to kind of um, play in the same vein that, that we, we see happening in the 112th House? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Donna, and Justin Farrell. I have my notes on here, so. Is this <clears throat> what, talk or strategy? Uh, talk, uh, yeah, to oh, talk, yeah. That one's the next one. Okay, um, thanks for having me, Timmons. I'm Justin Farrell. I'm an associate professor of, of sociology at, at Yale, um, and uh, it's really kind of fun to be here. We were in DC a couple months ago, and it's kind of it's nice to have a cohort of folks working on the same issues. Um, so thanks for having me. The title on the the worksheet is actually incorrect, and I'm going to be talking today about and presenting some new research um, on the growth of of climate change misinformation and these misinformation networks within U.S. philanthropy, and um, it complements some of my previous work, um, but tries to extend it as well. Um, so. You know, as we've kind of heard throughout, the private and individual corporations and, and corporate donors, especially from fossil fuel connected um, industry across a, the political spectrum, they really continue to to exert immense influence on U.S. politics, and and this uh, this influence has grown really in recent years, um, and the, the through public relations and the like. Um, but really, as Sheldon mentioned, through untraceable uh, philanthropy that that enable actors to give. Um, anonymously through pass-through organizations like Donors Trust. Um, so we have that going on. We also have the, the spread of misinformation. And um, the study of misinformation has really expanded even, I mean, it's almost by the day, um, scholars looking at that um, in the media um, and in politics and um, in, in government as well. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm of the mind that we know much more right now about misinformation than we do about philanthropy, um, and I'm using that term very broadly. Um, we know, you know, the producers of misinformation. We know we have a good idea about the content of misinformation. Well, we, at least with climate change, we know the producers. Um, some of the other arenas, we don't have as good of an idea, um, and we know how it's diffused. Um, but we really know much less about the the philanthrop philanthropic ecosystem that underwrites all of that, um, and, and I'm talking specifically with regard to climate change. Um, and one reason why, as I argue, and this, this is a paper that should be coming out in a few days um, in, in a journal, Environmental Research Letters, um, one reason we don't is because obviously it's so furtive and these, these activities are difficult to trace that we just don't have very good data. Um, you know, we don't have a bulk download of, of financial um, giving um, in most cases and, and a lot of this activity is kind of under the surface. So for scholars, it's very difficult research um, to, to uh, carry out. So, um, of, of the empirical knowledge that we do, do have about the philanthropic underpinnings of the production and spread of climate misinformation, it's largely limited to, to studies of the fossil fuel industry and their connections to lobbying efforts. Bob's work showed that um, in, in great, teal, great detail. Um, and obviously that's immensely important, um, but philanthropy is also so much bigger and, um, for, for example, $410 billion are donated each year in the U.S. alone. Um, 
small slice of that is, are, are from corporations. So, so it's, philanthropy is a huge enterprise, obviously, and a, and a pillar, uh, an institution in, in American life. Um, and so as I've kind of done some of this work over the years, I've I've thought about the broader avenues in which misinformation is traveling and climate skepticism and denial is traveling. It's not just in these fossil fuel connected um, groups, um, but is it, has it, is it more pervasive in, in um, U.S. philanthropy in general? So this, this new project that I'm, I'm going to present some of the results of, um, I sought to answer three basic questions. Is there empirical evidence of a relationship between what we might call mainstream um, or right-leaning philanthropy, um, I'll get to that in a second, and the climate misinformation movement. That is, is it diffused out into philanthropy more generally and not just within um, the, the traditional actors, the traditional cast of characters that we talk about? Um, second, is, is there evidence of a relationship? And then what factors might predict uh, the links between U.S. philanthropy and climate change misinformation efforts? And then third, has this relationship changed over time? So uh, in, in my work, I operationalize, and I think many of us do, um, these issues at an institutional level. We're not so, so much interested in public opinion. And um, as a couple of the presenters showed, it doesn't tend to matter as much. Um, and I agree with that. And, in, and with philanthropy in general, I operationalize it at the institutional level. And I think of it, all these issues at the institutional level and focus my measurement not on you know, individual donations like um, giving to a house of worship or donating a couple bucks after a natural disaster, but the actual institution of philanthropy and its impact on the political system. Um, and so we don't have evidence uh, of, a, of significant um, climate denial activities from left-leaning institutions. Um, so I focus a lot of my work uh, on right-leaning institutions who are perpetuating this. And so um, I felt in this paper in particular, I collected all the materials from Philanthropy Roundtable. Has anybody heard of Philanthropy Roundtable? It's a very large and powerful, um, far-reaching far um, philanthropic institution um, that is right-leaning. They also birthed um, and helped birth Donors Trust. Has anybody heard of Donors Trust? OK. Um, and so I focus on this, this institution. Um, and I collected all the text um, that I could get. Um, they produce Philanthropy Magazine. Um, they produce all sorts of other text materials um, that are read by the general public. They're read especially by um, powerful donors, wealthy donors. Um, and I also collected all the annual events and, and many other events that they've held. I collected the member lists and the event attendee lists at these events. Um, and so I'm focusing here on um, extracting names of people who are associated with this institution. With, um, and so that could be attending an event, that could be um, being written about in their magazine or, or writing an article in their magazine, um, writing a, a blog post, these sorts of things. Um, there's too much material to code all of this by hand, to extract names of people and organizations by hand. So I use um, natural language processing. Uh, you can essentially um, extract names of organizations, of people, of locations. Kind of like if you type something into Google, it will know if it's a location or not, or if it's a person or not. Um, it's a, the same sort of technology. It's called named entity extraction. And so what I've done, I kind of have this figure from the paper here. On the left is an article from, well, there's two articles from Philanthropy Magazine. One is from 1998, and one is from 2006. And in the yellow, it's, I'm, I, uh, it's highlighted in yellow there, just shows uh, how the machine can pick out like the University of Virginia as a location, but, which was interesting to me, but I was, I was focused on the name. So I extracted all the names of anybody who was ever, at, ever mentioned in their materials, ever at an event, um, and then pulled those out on the philanthropy data. So I had, let's see, yeah, 50, 53,000 people, uh, names of people. Um, I think about 14 or 15,000 were unique uh, people, and then 41,000 or organizations um, that were that were extracted. And in two previous articles um, that I've written, um, I have this roster essentially of climate skeptics or people who are associated with climate skeptic organizations. 
And what I wanted to do was very simple. I had this now, I had this list of names from the philanthropy data. I have the list of names from my other um, work. And I wanted to know, are those folks showing up more and more over time in the materials of um, this powerful right-leaning um, institution? And these people, it would, I, I would, I take that as evidence um, that the climate denial machine or apparatus or whatever you want to call it, um, it has a growing presence within this, um, this philanthropic institution that um, goes well beyond, you know, the, again, the traditional cast of characters like Exxon or something like that. And so being mentioned in a, in a you know, a magazine or at an event, speaking at an event, um, to me, I took that as an indicator of something um, somewhat important, especially if you're speaking at an event. So this just illustrates the matching process then between the denial um, organizations and people and then the um, phil philanthropy um, materials. And so you can see, even as an example, this top story in 1998, which was entitled, um, The Global Warming Debate Heats Up, Politicized Science and Its Supporters. And in this article, um, they explicitly uh, bemoan the fact that these that liberal um, foundations and liberal the liberal uh, philanthropy um, network is pushing climate change, and they need to ramp up the dollars that they're um, putting out to combat that. Um, and they and then in this specific article, they cite very well known um, climate denial um, scientists um, Patrick Michaels, Richard Lindzen. Um, and, and then in another article from 2006, you have the Heartland Institute um, and, and some others. Um, so uh, this was a, a good, ex I think, just kind of one example, but I wanted to look over 20 years' time at all, this, um, at all these materials. And so here are just some basic graphs. I have the paper on my website if you want to see the, the full thing. I won't go into too many of the methods right now, but on the left are the presence of people from that misinformation network within the, these philanthropy materials, within right-leaning philanthropy. Um, and you can see, uh, especially in, with people, more and more people begin showing up. And um, with organizations, you see it spike as well. These, these curves here kind of illustrate that. Um, and it wasn't, these, these numbers and these graphs aren't due to the total number of people at events or anything like that. It is just spike, uh, there's a spike in climate denial uh, actors at these, in these texts and at these events. Um, so, oh, let's see, so in 1997 there were only 30 people recorded in, from, the, from the Misinformation Network in Philanthropy and then um, less than 10 years later the, that presence had um, increased by 443 percent. Um, in 1997 there were 20, just 20 organizations from um, the list of denial, the groups that we, that previous research has established. Um, and then by 2006, that number had grown by 345%. Um, and so you see uh, a dramatic spike there. I <clears throat> also wanted to know, related to my second related research question was, um, are there observable patterns that, that can help explain this growth that we just saw in those graphs? Um, in other words, for me, I was wondering, was the integration of, of this climate denial, people, these people and organizations who are spreading that, um, into this quote-unquote mainstream kind of philanthropy, um, was it a smaller group or was it kind of broad base? And this, this figure that I have in the paper shows that, um, and funding, sorry, I should say funding relates to whether or not this, the organizations in the denial um, network had received funding from either ExxonMobil or Coke. And, if, and what this shows is that in the red line there, um, well, you should just look at the kind of the graph, um, indicates that if they had received funding, they're much more likely to be um, integrated into this. So 91% of the climate denial organizations um, pr present at philanthropy events and, and in these materials had received funding from the, either of these two actors. And 86% of the people um, that were showing up at events and in these materials had also were affiliated with an organization that received funding. So corporate fund, or at least fossil fuel related corporate funding still matters a great deal here. Um, and again, just three, three main takeaways. Um, and I think we can talk about this more next session as well, but uh, I've, I really think that we need to develop our methodological approach to studying these issues 
Um, it's, they're very difficult issues to study in part um, because they're supposed to be difficult by those folks who stand to lose. And so the data, uh, we have to be very creative about how we go about getting it. And, um, and, and, and it, so we're able to, to really um, put forth robust and um, respected uh, scientific studies of this. And, and right now, the data are just so hard to come by, which is why we don't have as much research as we should. Um, the second thing here related to this specific project is there was a robust relationship that developed within um, this, this philanthropic institution, which is, is very important um, in, I would say, in, in shaping philanthropy in the U.S., at least on the right. Um, and um, that's kind of the main takeaway there. And then last is corporate and fossil fuel money still matters for predicting um, the impact uh, of these findings. And that, that's not going away. And I, you know, it can happen in lots of different ways, especially as Bob just showed with PR. Um, but here, um, influencing just philanthropy in general. Um, so, uh, and thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, right, there's a link if you want to read the paper on, on my website. Where's yours? Do you have one? Leave it to. Mm -hmm. Is it called or not? Yep, that's, that's me. I didn't see the last name. Hmm. <sighs> yep. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying with me. Um, my name is Carrie Ard. I am um, assistant professor at Ohio State University at the School of Environment and Natural Resources. And I'm presenting to you a paper that I worked on with two of my students. Um, it's a little bit dated now, at least a year or two old. One of them's already gone on to a faculty position. So, um, but it's about the climate change counter movement, the industries that have contributed to political action campaigns, which are also called PACs. I look at the donations of these over time, as well as their relationship to congressional voting. Um, does anybody know what that picture is? The Willard, Willard Hotel lobby and the representation of it to lobbyists? Is it? That's where the name came from. Okay, that's, um, so uh, yeah, Ulysses S. Grant, thank you. Uh, look, yes, Ulysses S. Grant supposedly um, would go here and smoke cigars and would complain about all the damn lobbyists coming to, to bother him. That's um, a lovely story and people like it. It's nostalgic and it, it does, uh, it helps the hotel lobby, but that's not where it came from. Um, it came from the, <laughs> the halls of, um, of London. So that was uh, a story, but it's perpetuated because it makes us feel good and it, it helps, um, helps the, the hotel do well. So I feel like that's a, a good anecdote to start this presentation um, to kind of put you in the right minds of where we're going. So first, I, um, I was academically raised by an environmental historian, and she taught me don't just ask where we are, but ask how we got here. So whenever I do anything, you have to really understand the context, the historical context that led us to where we are. So the context of the counter um, climate denier movement or climate change counter movement really began with the environmental movement. So a long time ago, a long time ago, not that long, 1950s, you know, we would be happily spraying DDT. We were enjoying technology, helping people. Um, people started getting sick, right? People started realizing that there was some problems, that maybe we can't trust industry to take care of us, um, that you know they're not always having our best interests in mind. So um, the United States started passing some command and control policies, right? We had these media images of the um, waters burning, of um, people getting ill. Uh, Rachel Carson's book, of course, had major impacts, and we started passing these very uh, str stringent federal regulations, right? Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Um, this also had an effect internationally, so we started having the United Nations um, Environmental Program, the Rio Earth Summit, and these new environmental institutions, not only domestically but internationally, started to gain momentum. Um, the Rio, this is a picture of Time Magazine. Everybody was, you know, we had Newt Gingrich, uh, you know, saying that we need to do something about climate change and protecting, um, protecting America, protecting the environment. 
Um, I wonder, maybe Kurt Davies is in this picture over here. Um, <laughs> we had the Greenpeace organization. Um, so we had these new environmental organizations that were, that were um, taking the world stage and had policies behind them, right? Um, so, you know, as a business person who, who is feeling uh, all of these new regulations coming, seeing these new institutions um, at the international level who are all focusing on, on you, right, um, business started to push back. So this is a Chamber of Commerce luncheon, 1971. They were mocking the protests that were happening at the time. Um, so this was 1970s, this was early on, 1971 of the environmental movement. They were able to kind of directly attack people um, and you know, kind of make fun of the, the organizations that were happening. But Judith Lazier, who um, passed away recently, somewhat recently, she was an MIT professor. She argued that after the environmental movement, corporations couldn't attack people directly. Instead, they came up with this um, more subtle means. And this is a, um, a very messy, but probably pretty accurate representation of how organizations um, try to influence Congress, specifically on issues that are uh, the public, right? You can't come out and say to the public, I am I'm against, you know, protecting the environment. I'm, a, I'm a, you know, supportive of toxic pollutants, right? Um, so instead, corporations kind of use these back more subtle means to get um, their, their interests protected. So, the majority of the literature so far, these wonderful people I have here, have really looked at kind of the, the think tanks and the PRs, uh, the PR organizations. But um, in this paper, we were trying to figure out PACs. PACs are an interesting um, vehicle which uh, to affect Congress, and they come about at about the same time as this whole counter movement. So. Um, this uh, I brought with me because last time when we were presented to um, the senator, Senator Marquis really liked this book. It's um, something that the one of the climate change denial movement institutes, the Heartland Institute, um, sent this book over to 200,000 um, K through 12 science teachers. I actually got it in my inbox, um, I mean, at my office. I brought it with me if anybody wants to look at it. Um, you'll notice that it was. Um, written by the non-governmental <laughs> international <laughs> panel on climate change. Um, so what has paid for these really were actually these PACs. So political action committees uh, aren't a new thing, right? So they've been around since 1943, but there was a change in 1947 that allowed corporations to use their own funds, their treasury money, right? Um, and, you know, 1974 is when that happened, right around the same time that, cor that corporations were realizing, shit, we can't just come out and attack, we have to kind of do these subtle ways to, to get our interests protected. So it really went hand in hand with, um, with PAC donations. So um, it, uh, PAC donations allow for unlimited uh, independent expenditures, which are these kind of TV ads that we're all very familiar with and really became an important part of um, a multi-pronged electioneering strategy. So those kind of, um, that, that mess of, of lines, it's a very important part of that now. So in this paper, we tried to uh, uh, quantify that. We looked at federal election commissions, PAC donation data um, from 92 different industries. So we only did this up to 2010, because as we've heard today in 2010, the game changed, right? Things kind of, um, exploded and and uh, but from 1990 to 2010 is is a good way to look at the trajectory of how corporations were using PAC donations to influence Congress. So from 1990 to 2010 we looked at 304 bills, how um, representatives voted on them, so 4,717 House of Representatives. Um, and then these are how we organize the industries. They have industries have SIC codes, so all of their in the the major organization as well as their subsister, uh, subsidiaries were organized according to their SIC codes. So we have agribusiness, retail, labor, lawyers, um, natural resources, and then we um, pulled out climate change counter movement industries, which um, Bob had shown in previous studies that were the ones who were primarily behind this. So what did we find? First off, that climate change counter movement industries are increasingly using this strategy. So they're increasingly donating to PACs over time. Um, again, this stops at 2010, but we can expect that these trajectories um, continue. So we have labor unions also, finance and health, 
um, increasingly donated um, to to organ uh, sorry congressional members over time. So this is the average average annual difference in PAC donations given to Republicans compared to Democrats. So on the left hand side are um, those organizations that gave more to Democrats, and on the right-hand side are those organizations that gave more to Republicans. We definitely have labor, but all that's really the only one that gives more to Democrats. And if you combine all of the Republicans, it pretty much adds up to labor. So the second most polarized group are the climate change counter-movement industries, who give much more to Republicans. So then, uh, to figure out the effect of this, we had individual representatives. Um, we fixed, you know, their race, their sex, their, we controlled for all of this. We have this person, right? And then we look at them over time and we try to figure out if you donate this amount to them by this industry, how does it influence their, um, their votes in Congress over time? And we found that for every additional $10,000 a, a member received from a climate change counter movement industry, it decreased the probability of voting for pro-environmental protection by 2%. Um, oil and gas, when we broke down not just climate change industry, but into the component industries, um, we saw that it was largely oil and gas which was leading this. So they had um, decreased probability of voting for environmental protections by 4% utilities by 3%. But what we found interesting was the difference by party. So for um, it was more impactful for Democrats. So for every additional $10,000 a Democrat received from a climate change counter movement organization, they were 3% more likely to vote against environmental protection. And agriculture had the most consistent effect. In general, anybody who received an extra $10,000 from an agricultural industry um, decreased their odds of voting to protect the environment by 2%. So <clears throat> I think these are important takeaways. The, what, what are the most impactful things for a representative to vote against their party platform? So for the Democrats, it was a um, natural resource pack. So these are American Sports Fishing Association, kind of the hunting aspect of it. Um, they would, uh, for every 10,000 extra dollars, they would, um, the probability that they would vote pro-environmental went down by 52%. But I feel like this is the most positive takeaway that we can leave um, this, uh, this, this in, um, which is that you know, if you are a person who donates to an environmental organization um, and that organization donates $10,000 to a Republican, the probability that they will protect the environment goes up by 48%. So you know, that's some positive news. I think we need more of that. I mean, obviously, as we've seen with, our, with my colleagues here, um, the amount of money that these organizations, that environmental organizations are giving to congressmen and congresswomen um, is not as great. So, um, but it looks like it, when they do give, it does have a major impact. I just have a quick question. It's relative probability, right, that you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to know. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was my conclusion. In general, climate change counter movement has indeed made greater use of PACs. Um, and they were significantly associated with Democrats voting against their party platform. Um, and we need to take a more holistic approach to understanding this political strategy. So instead of just focusing on um, public opinion, which we know that doesn't always have a major impact on Congress, we, we need to kind of look at the whole picture. So thank you very much. Thank you to our four panelists. I want to back up, if I can, to that nice figure, the main figure with all the pads on it. From Stephen Barley's book. So um, thank you all for sticking with us. Um, I want to make sure to leave lots of time for questions. But I do want to uh, start us out. Because I think in some ways we kind of came in on the 13th floor here probably on both the morning and the afternoon sessions. That is, for people who aren't in these academic fields, there's a lot that you may not have known. Um, and that'll be, I suppose, true also in our final session. We'll try to be sure that we're laying some of the groundwork. So there is now a burgeoning social science of you know, why we are not acting on climate change in the United States. And I would say, there's um, researchers Riley Dunlap and Aaron McCright who are, um, have worked for quite a long time um, looking at the climate denial movement specifically on 
climate denial think tanks. They did an analysis where they actually um, looked at the arguments that those think tanks were using over the years and how those have shifted as the evidence has piled up. And they're very effective at shifting sort of, I call them the trenches, that first they're defending of the trenches, there's no uh, climate change. Then it's, oh, it's cyclical or it's not human caused. And then when that's not defensible, then it's human caused, but it's not that bad. Or it's human caused and it's actually good. And then there's another trench behind that, which is it's, it's human caused, it's bad, but we could spend the money better on other things like adapting or helping people overcome poverty and that we, you know, we can't change our style of life and the, the economy is too fragile. And there's more trenches behind those and we're beginning to see those trenches. Um, there's always another trench. Um, and there are very effective trenches um, because we keep fighting uh, trench by trench. Uh, and as World War I historians know, it's a bloody battle and it lasts way too long and uh, the bodies are starting to pile up. So, um, uh, and they have a lot of other work on public, you know, public uh, opinion. And I think the public is quite an important actor in this whole system. I mean, if we're trying to deal with climate change in America, of course we need, as we heard this morning, and from, and Debbie as well, that companies need clear policy signals. And for them to get those signals, we need action by Congress and the administration. And there are many paths in this diagram. Not all of them turn out to be that important. And I think uh, some of the research is starting to show, as we saw some today already, that the public opinion is unfortunately not as important as we might, might like to hear. That is, we want to believe that we should be paying attention to the public. And we, you know, as democratic uh, people with democratic values, that's, that's important to us. But in fact, a lot of this is an elite problem, that it's an elite issue, that it is one industry, a set of corporations you know, driving our public policy through other channels. And if you ever watch the Sunday morning news shows, I think you'll get what I mean, the advertisements on there are almost all for military subcontractors and fossil fuel corporations and others that are seeking to influence congressional staff, agency staff, um, and the sort of key actors in the middle of this organization. Um, Bob Rule's research, a lot of uh, his other research, he's sort of been the one who's been, I think, most actively trying to understand this map and uh, characterizing different flows in this. So it's very exciting to have him here in Rhode Island at working at Brown and with my lab group and with uh, hopefully we're hoping to uh, support this kind of research uh, emerging around the country. Um, and he shows that in some other work that the spending, comparative spending of, of those who would oppose uh, climate change action and those, you know, sort of environmental organizations that push for it, the spending ratios are about four to one in terms of lobbying. So there's four times as much spending. Am I getting that right? Ten to one. No, it's ten to one is lobbying. Ten to one is lobbying. It's political political contributions four to one. Okay, pl I got those two backwards. So f and then uh, the lobbying is ten to one, and advertising is twenty to one. Yeah. So it's an incredibly unbalanced uh, relationship. Um, we have so much else to talk about here. Justin has been one of the people who have talked about how the funding from corporations really influences um, the, the language that comes from, uh, you know, think tanks and, and, how, and, start, and, then, and then Bob as well is trying to, you know, understand these flows to foundations. Some of these flows are easy to track, some of them are impossible to track. Some of them are important flows, some are not. I mean, these are really important organizations, these uh, peak organizations, give me an example. American oh, Petroleum Institute, the Chamber, the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, Chamber. right. So this is a very important organization in, the, in this. Um, of course, lobbying firms, we often don't even know who they are. We know we heard of, hear about K Street in Washington, but there's many other like law firms that, that act as lobbyists in, in every state capital here in Providence. We have many that are you know, at the state house representing different, um, especially trade organizations. Uh, we do hear, we know some things about PACs and their influence. There's, of course, all this other dark money channels that are going directly to, to defeat or to, you know, primary election uh, candidates. Um, and then there's, of course, these PR firms. And then there's these ad hoc organizations. So this is what um, a group led by um, Caroline Jones in my lab looked at to try to characterize um, 
who are these different groups that are pulled together from different actors, from corporate, corporate members and then also peak organizations, trade organizations, to try to defeat specific kinds of legislation on climate change. And they've, again, been extremely successful, 30 years of action. So I guess just as a way to start out a discussion in here, what do you all think are sort of the biggest research gaps and, uh, and what's needed? You go first, what I think. Um, I think it's, my answer would have been different two years ago, three years ago. I, with Riley, who was mentioned, and some others, we had some really great, great work in the 90s and 2000s, mostly in the 2000s, that looked at a handful of organizations, what they were writing. Um, but lately, some of the um, methods within data science and um, text analysis, social network analysis have really enabled us to get a handle on the network of folks and, and how they exchange information, how they, not just, so it's not just money, right? It's information, it's ideas, um, strategies. And so being able to look at the interconnected nature of this whole, um, I would call it a network or um, a machine or um, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, um, because it is all connected and, and there aren't as many actors as we might think. Um, and so I think just focusing in terms of the connections between the, um, the organizations, the people, um, and, and that, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would point to one key player that kind of got away scot free. Um, big, oh. big act. Yeah, truly. Oh, Mike. sorry. That's great. So uh, I said I would point to a key player that got away uh, so far is um, Big Ag and its role in, in, in climate change. and. We would, would need some research yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Agriculture. Big agriculture business. So, in yeah. specific, who do you mean? Like, sorry. Farm who? Bureau. A farm bureau, like the influence yeah. of the farm bureau, and and we know that they, that uh, everyone's focusing on, on on fossil fuels and all that, but agriculture plays a big role, and they yeah. they they're not they're not getting the focus and the attention. I, I for me, of course. What, what I've found is, is the simultaneity of how the strategies, how these yeah. campaigns work in an integrated way. It's the same time that they have a PR campaign and they're putting out a lot of corporate propaganda. You know, ExxonMobil will put out its ad. At the same time, the American Petroleum Institute, which ExxonMobil happens to be a, you know, the 500-pound gorilla on their board, is doing a different ad, you know, promoting fossil, just directly promoting fossil fuels as fossil fuels are the fuels of the future. They're doing that. At the same time, they're going to be lobbying. At the same time of that, they're going to be doing PACs. And so the problem is, is that we have these coordinated, integrated campaigns, and we're just trying to piece how they work together. And, and for me, one of, I think, you know, my current research really focuses on the role of, of, these, of these PR companies, is that, uh, 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 is that we know that the 1960s and 70s movements caught corporations flat-footed. And we also know that the PR industry, led by the people that fought against Rachel Carson's book, that they started the very first kind of anti-environmental movement by attacking Rachel Carson, went on to develop a whole series of integrated techniques um, that they now sell to corporations. So you can go to Fleshman Hillard or you can go to Edelman Communications. And for example, Edelman Communications gets $100 million from the American Petroleum Institute to carry out its whole campaign. And so that whole campaign process, which we have just little slivers of, of information about, could include a PR campaign, a grassroots campaign, going out and uh, recruiting third-party spokespersons to, you know, to write editorials and to say that climate change isn't real or whatever, giving money, they, they might, we don't know, but I suspect that some of the money going to some of the third-party, to the conservative think tanks comes through the advertising company, because ExxonMobil can then be two or three times removed and say, oh, we don't give to them, we gave to API. Well, but then API says, well, we gave to Fleshman Hillard. And Fleshman Hillard gave to them, you know, and so you can have this kind of money laundering campaign. We don't know how that works. And I'm really waiting for the discovery process to come out of either the all the various legal suits 
uh, or, or to have Congress do investigations to figure out how this process works, because we just run into straight, you know, dark, we just don't know. We can't say it. We can, we can infer. We can talk about theories of it. But for me, this is sort of where the, trying to understand the, the totality of how this, how they coordinate all these things all at the same time is really quite remarkable. And That's great. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Oh. Um, Carrie, you got to go with that. Oh, no, I, I was I, in total agreement, yes. I was just going to say that I, I think, um, I think what Senator Whitehouse said about uh, uh, bringing lawsuits against them and, and comparing this to the tobacco industry, I think, is really helpful mm -hmm. as we move forward. Let's open it up for some questions from the audience to keep people going. We have two back, three back there. Thank you, Mark. Our cameraman. No, give it to Steve. Oh, okay. This is just a quick follow-up on Timmons' question, which is um, where do universities fit into this framework? Yeah. Because they're certainly influenced by corporations as well. Can we take all three questions and then we'll have three, an uh, three answers or yeah. merge them together? Because they might overlap. On that note, uh, Lindsay Mackinson, I am a student at George Washington University down in D.C. studying political science. So all of this is very familiar to me, kind of bouncing off that conversation about PACs and this web and the lack of disclosure in nonprofits. Mm -hmm. For me, a lot of this question comes back to the congressional side and to the policy side because this whole idea of dark money and nonprofits fu funneling is not unique to fossil fuels. It's not unique to the right. This is something that's going on at all levels for all different types of interests. And so if this is something we want to be tackling, it's a little bit more high level than that. It's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> Very good comment. Thank you. Uh, I'm a local journalist, and I do a lot of work in this area. And I noticed a few years ago we saw um, sort of an ad hoc, uh, astro like what do you call it, astroturfing, right, campaign going on. And it was contributed to in part by the labor industry. Right, and I see your chart said labor goes to Democrats, and but I'm also seeing money from labor, especially the building trades, going into Democrats, Democratic supporting Democratic candidates, but also issues like building a power plant, gas-powered power plant here in the state. And so I was wondering <coughs> if anybody else has seen that, noted that, or seen any of that influence. Well, I'm going to take three, and then we're going to answer. Yeah, then we'll come back. I'll speak to the university question. Um, I think there, and to Tim's question too, there are a lot of areas for new research, but for me the last few years it's how the research is viewed by some or even um, handled by some. So, um, for example, um, I, I think some people write it off as conspiracy theory or sort of kind of a kooky research and, and it's not taken seriously in that, in that way. And, that, and then likewise at the university level or even among journal editors, there's a sense that it might be to like politicize research, um, and so there's a hesitancy to either promote it if it's a university, or um, fund, if it. fund it, or accept it um, if you're a journal editor. A lot of the papers that I've published are heavily uh, edited, which you know, a lot of times it's good, but um, I always wonder kind of would a similar topic be edited in the same way, and, um, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. But I think we need to figure out how to maybe communicate our research, you know, better way, I guess, but. I can address a little bit of, I, maybe on the university project, I mean, that's the only one that I could ever, there actually is some good research about what we, what we would consider to be corporate steering of academic research agendas and, or, or, or the educational process itself. And so you have, we have well-documented data about the conservative movement's efforts to fund and structure educational uh, universities like George, George Mason University, most particularly funded by the Koch, Koch operation, but uh, we have uh, Caroline Jones has a paper in, pro in process all about the, the whole Koch, sort of Koch structuring of, of these undergraduate education programs at these universities. Uh, but, it's, it, but it's not just limited to that, and this is what's really quite interesting is that ExxonMobil in the fossil fuel industry has been a major player in the development of climate change programs at major elite universities. Princeton, Harvard, MIT, all heavily, heavily funded by fossil fuel interests. Okay, and what does that do to the structure, what questions are asked, and, and, and what sort of research agendas are followed 
is 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 quite interesting because you don't see uh, people talking about climate denial at any three at Princeton, at Stanford, or MIT. It's just not a topic that they're that they're comfortable doing. There's other things that they do, but it's certainly not investigating the funding flows to universities, including their own. And so you end up with what it it, it ends up with sort of putting a, a finger on the research agendas at different universities. And so when you give Stanford University's program, you know, several hundred million dollars to research alternative fuels, okay, that's alternative fuels, and that's what they're doing at Stanford. Does that crowd out other stuff at the university, or does that tilt the university? And, you know, I've, I've, I was at Stanford at the uh, Center for Advanced Study up on the Hill there for a year, and it's really interesting is how the the process at Stanford doesn't really, they just don't look in this area at all. It's just not there. It's not there at Harvard. I mean, they got Naomi Reskes there, which would be really interesting to have her talk about her experiences at Harvard. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how that, that's turned out, but that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. But I think that there is that kind of steering, and it continues. And I know that the AGU had a great big battle about trying to get ExxonMobil out of steering, out of having influence over the American Geophysical Union. Um, and I think they ExxonMobil finally quit. Okay. So do we have uh, anybody want to take a swing at the other two questions? I just uh, want to make a comment about, I, I can't speak to the local politics of the labor um, unions, but at, at least in my data, it's all clumped together, right? So, you know, maybe maybe there are some labor unions that are, are veering it one way while the majority of them are veering it the other way. So it doesn't discount your, your experience is what I was. Yeah. <laughs> So let's, let's take another round. Sorry, I don't know if we've really got Okay, uh, this question is for Professor Farrell specifically. Um, both, I, I saw you speak in DC a few months ago and again today, and both those studies I sort of noticed your use of uh, technology and big data analytics and like AI stuff, um, which I hadn't been exposed to at all in this sort of fi like field of sociology of this climate de denial network we see on the screen here. So I was wondering if you could speak specifically on um, what people in, uh, as a part of this coordinated academic effort can do um, to improve, like to sort of learn from your methodological innovations and sort of, because we're working with so much material here, um, how how can we streamline our processes using technology? Sure, yeah. Um, the big thing is it's allowing us to, to um, ask new questions that we weren't able to ask before and to get new data um, that we weren't able to get or that isn't out there. And so there's so many things being digitized these days um, that you know we can collect a ton of information, right? And then when you have that, like I showed, which I did, I had several million words of text and other articles I, I've worked with um, you know, millions and millions of, of, of documents, and what do we do with that, right? And so you need to harness these methods um, to, to be able to find either it's like themes in text. So in one article, I, I um, coded um, all the climate denial literature um, that had ever been written up to I think, 2013 or 14. And I can't read that on my own, right? Um, but I was able to use a, a method called structural topic modeling that allowed me to get a handle on what was being said out there. Otherwise, it was just all noise. Um, and so um, I'm all for using, quote unquote, big data and all of that. I think it's great. We still need to ask really um, basic research questions that you would <coughs> ask with any other type of data. Um, but the one thing I think is that this field of research is really, really hard because the data just aren't out there for you to get, right? You can, if you're working, I do some other work in, in my home state of Wyoming on energy, then I can download, you know, Bureau of Economic Analysis data, I can download census data and all of that, and it's very easy. But this, we oftentimes have to create our own data sets. And um, so using these tools like natural language processing, where I can pull out all the names of people in these texts, um, spanning 20 year span, uh, span is great, you know, and it allows me to get a handle on kind of what's going on and who's involved. Um, so 
So, but the big thing is to still focus on a research question and research design like, like you would in any other, um, you know, topic. But um, yeah. just want to put in a plug. Uh, pr professor will be coming next year to Brown. Uh, Rachel Wetz from uh, Berkeley, who does a lot of this um, structural topic modeling on issues of climate change is going to be very exciting. Also, Tom Marlowe is leading a little project out of the lab on Twitter discourses on climate change around the signing and the unsigning of the uh, Paris Agreement. So anyway, there's so, so much that can be done. With this, is going to be millions of tweets. Who's next? Um, I wanted to get back to the question of what about other areas where, where this is happening, not just the environment, and also to Carrie's yeah. point about history, <coughs> right? So how much of this? Are we studying now because it's relevant for climate change? Do we know what this looks like for other fields? When we look at history, um, Senator Whitehouse mentioned, you know, cigarette and tobacco. But even if we look back further, if we look at the Food and Drug Act, there's this great book that just came out on the history of 40 years that it took to get it passed. Do we know what this looks like in other areas? Or are, you know, are you studying both? Or is this specialized? Do we think it's so different for different issues that we, we study it? you know, issues specifically. I, 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 I can respond to that. I mean, the, the history of sort of attacking the science, science misinformation, or what now, what now goes under the, the rubric of what's called product defense is, is kind of what, what the topic. And there's, there's a whole series of books that really sort of go back to, you know, the, the controversy over lead. And, and then, you know, the controversy over air pollution, which started after World War II, you know, API was, you know, they're saying, oh, no, don't worry about air pollution, it's not a problem. Um, then the tobacco industry picks up some of these techniques, um, and then they get refined in the battle over Rachel Carson's book, and then the PR companies pick this up in the 70s and 80s and really develop a, technolo a, a, a technology that can go to, you know, defending beryllium or climate change or, in other words, there's sort of a commonality in this sort of thread of, of sort of the, the, the manipulation of information uh, to provide really disinformation. And it goes under, there's a t agnotology, there's a whole series that Robert Proctor is working on sort of doing the history of this sort of thing. As, as sort of a climate researcher, you sort of go, you read that stuff and sort of that's your general theoretical stuff that you read on and then you can apply it. But what you can see is this sort of historical development of these sort of, of integrated techniques like that, that she show that Barley shows just for climate. It's, this is no, a kind of, you know, not just about climate, right? This no, is, no, this no. is general, this is yeah. about, but this, this is was developed the general, for other areas. Yeah. yeah is that, that these kind of techniques and processes uh, form a larger literature that we're working within. And so we might focus our stuff on climate, but you know, you can see the same sorts of stuff with tobacco, with lead, with the beryllium, with, uh, what is it, the, the um, and probably the food. Roundup. Yeah. Safety Act. Yeah, Roundup, Monsanto, chemical sort of stuff. In other words, there's now, there's a, this sort of body, growing body of literature about this whole kind of social yeah, process. And, and Laura Donna, what, is it similar in tax spending, do you know? I mean, across issue areas? Hmm. I don't know. Okay, Carrie, anybody want to take a swing at that, too? We could ask the senator, is it the same? <laughs> do you get the same kind of approach from uh, all sides on other issues? The climate issue is far and away the climate issue is far and away the most salient one right now. Uh, there's so much money at stake and they've got to lie and push and prod and threaten so prodigiously to keep things at bay. I mean, we're now at 73% concern and approval that climate is real, we should do something about it. So they're holding back enormous amount of public pressure that you don't see for neonicotinoids or for you know, lead paint fights kind of already over and but gun control. so forth. Yeah. Gun is a little bit uh, <clears throat> different. It runs in its own lane more because um, I don't know quite why, but I don't think of it as being like a, a product in the, quite in the same way. There are overlaps, but in my experience, it runs a little bit more in its own lane, whereas the climate, lead, tobacco, um, round up, all those are very much using the same institutions, the same techniques, 
the same language, the same rhetoric, in many cases the same phony baloney scientists and mouthpieces, the same PR firms. There's lots of overlap, but climate is just really salient right now and the money's so big that that's where most of the energy is going in my view. We have time for one more question. Um, just, just a really quick question about, so are there any watchdogs out there who are looking at some of these? I would imagine some of these organizations are nonprofits and have to do reporting to places like the IRS. And if there's mission, if it's not subscribing to their particular mission or if there's mission creep, isn't the IRS kind of give them a call and say, hey, come on in, let's talk? Republicans okay. did to the IRS commissioner the last time. Yeah, I Carrie, can you start on this one? Oh, I was just going to say yeah, Kurt's organization. Right well, we're going to have Kurt up here, uh, Kurt Davies, in the next session who can, I think, answer some of that. Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes, there are a few. <laughs> um, the IRS, I consider to be a joke. I don't think that they do any enforcement whatsoever. I mean, Senator Whitehouse points out to me that, that you know, these, one, on one side they send in their IRS form that says we don't do any political contributions, and they send that into the IRS, but then to the Federal Elections Commission, they send in, this is how much we spent on, on, on political activity. So you've got two reports, two different agencies that, that, that contradict each other. And is there any check or is there any enforcement of this? Well, no, I mean, but it's a prima facie contradiction. And the IRS just, uh, just, just rolls with it, I think. I don't know that they do anything. I mean, it just, I just sort of view the IRS rules for nonprofit organizations. I mean, the Heartland Institution that puts out that non governmental, you know, intergovernmental panel on climate change is classified as a nonprofit charitable educational institution. It's not an advocacy group, it's a charitable education institution, which means that supposedly the things that are on its website are supposed to be accurate and scientifically correct, and if they're not, they should not be out there. Well, Heartland Institute's IRS deduction is not under question that it wouldn't be, you know, removed and made to become a 40C4, which, you know, that, but the Sierra Club got stuck over in that way, you know. So, you know, that was, Nixon decided to move the Sierra Club over there because he got pissed off at him. But, you know, for me, the IRS enforcement of the nonprofit organizational rules is just, just non-existent. As far but as it would be useful for us to run through. Like on, on political can contributions, there is common cause, or who else is putting out this information? No, but, but I could say that we rely a lot uh, when we collect data on, on places like, we, we rely a lot on uh, when we collect the data on groups such as op uh, Open Secrets Open or, Secrets, or yeah. Union yeah. of Concerned yeah. uh, Scientists. Yeah. Right? yeah. So they do really amazing work in, yeah. in you know. ProPublica. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's what I mean. Oh, and, then, and, and for those of you who want to focus on climate, you go to the Climate Investigation Center, right. and they have this whole great big thing called Climate Docs mm -hmm. that you can, all of these things, all of the documents filed by you know, ExxonMobil knew this and that, and when did they do it, and when did the Global Climate Change Coalition start, and what did they do, and who are all the coalitions out there? It's all there. You can download it. You can see the annotated stuff. There so is also really there is a lobbying database. Um, yeah, that's, that's that open secrets. Yeah, that's, that's open, open secrets. Yeah. But yeah. we still rely upon yeah. like FEC data. I yes, mean, they still true. go in and IRS. and get yeah, and, and IRS data. Yeah. But that's why we need these third party organizations like. Um, Climate Investigation Center and Open Secrets to kind of go in and and distill them and clean them up and you know present the bias yeah, that is there. They're very hard to use this raw data. Absolutely, highly problematic. For example, in Rhode Island, the lobbying reporting was not well systematized. It's there. They tried to make it more rigorous in 2017. So you have no historical data, yeah. really, um, to be able to categorize this. We were unable to really characterize the flows of lobbying you know, funding uh, for the state, period. The data is bad. One question, the, the, the difficulty with the, just the funding flow mm -hmm. through these foundations is none of it's digitized. So you, we didn't know anything about the Mercer Foundation until two years ago. It turns out they are the major funder of the Heartland Institute. They probably paid for this book. They've given them six something million dollars in the last decade. And I didn't know who they were a couple years ago, and this is all I obsess about. And 
They are the top funder on their IRS form is Heartland, has been since 2008 when they gave them a $1 million grant. So, and that's a, and by the way, also responsible for Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway being in the White House and also Breitbart and Cambridge Analytica, the same family, two people, mm -hmm. New Yorkers. Um, so that's the kind of things we're dealing with. It's, uh, there are wild cards and there are uh, sort of entities of, of uh, obtuse influence. You know, they have, um, they have extra influence. So in, let's, um, uh, well, let me look ahead. We're going to be able to continue this conversation after a coffee break. So we're taking a 15-minute coffee break. Mark, we're staying on schedule. Um, and this, then we're going to come back and talk about what are we, how do we move forward? How do we push back against this uh, climate denial and defending science? I think I've asked the senator to come back up for that panel. Does that sound good? So, um, so he'll come back up, and then we'll have Kurt Davies, myself, Carrie, and then we'll talk about a paper that three of our I'll introduce it. Three authors and uh, Justin will be introducing that. So come back in 15 minutes, and then we'll have a reception after that. Thank you all. It's a great job.